DNS, or Domain Name System, is today's topic. This is Scott Forsyth here, checking in for week number two of a 52-week series. And so these next 50 weeks upcoming, I plan to touch base on many things related to the web administrator. So whether it's IIS, some SQL Server, troubleshooting of various types, load balancing, ARR, URL rewrite, many different technologies. So looking forward to what's in store. So today I wanted to touch base on DNS. It's really a core part, absolutely core part of the internet. And so I wanted to take apart a DNS zone just to really understand it a little bit more. What are the core aspects to it? How does it apply to us? And uh, of course it helps us with troubleshooting, setting up new domains, and the more we understand, the better. So for today, what I want to do is use Microsoft DNS Server. There's many different DNS technologies out there, DNS servers, but they all follow the same standard so that they all talk to each other. Microsoft's is great. It does scale well, and also it's very easy to visualize. So that's why I want to be able to use it today here. It's easy to understand exactly what's happening. On this server, I've installed DNS Server Role and you do that from Server Manager, install the role. Now, for the most part, unless you want to actually manage a number of zones, I recommend using other services. For example, Dyn DNS is what we use for uh, vastnet.com. And so it's a third-party service. They manage it. They do all the hard work. Let them do it, and that's completely fine. Uh, at the same time, I can still show the principles here from the DNS because the what an MX record is, what an A record is, C name, those still apply regardless. So keep tuning in even if you're not planning to use Windows DNS Server. First thing I want to do is create a DNS zone. A primary zone is what you would have, basically that's where your authoritative answers are. And your secondary zone is used for secondary servers. So what you usually have is one server is a primary and you have multiple secondary or at least one. So two servers at the minimum so it's fully redundant. And in this case we're going to manage a primary one. So let's set up contoso.com and we'll go ahead with its default name. Now this particular server I'm using for this demo is not part of an Active Directory domain so we don't have the option of an AD integrated zone which is not a problem. So we have a bare bones zone now created for us. contoso.com with the two records the SOA or the start of authority and it has the one NS record was they assumed for us. So our start of authority is kinda like the primary information for the zone. Again if you go with a third party you're not gonna see any information about the SOA and you don't have to worry about that. Really what that is it's a serial number this increments every time a change is made this will increment so that the secondary servers know that a change has been made. You have your primary server just some information responsible person and then you have some refresh intervals how long the zone lives and stuff like that your time to live TTL and the other core record here again you're not going to see with third-party services as much is your name server and let's delete the default one it gives us and if we were trying to make up one it's not going to work because it doesn't resolve and Windows DNS is not going to let us add it if it doesn't consider it accurate but let's use ForksWebs name servers. NS3, resolve that one and let's add NS4. Okay, so now we have our SOA and our NS records. Okay, let's get into the common ones, the fun ones here. So if we look here we have our host or an A record are the exact same name or a quad A is used for IPv6. We'll see more in the upcoming months and, and years. But a host and A, people ever occasionally ask, what's the difference between them? There's no difference. It's the same, exact same thing, different name. So what you'll normally do, you see here at the top, is in Windows DNS, you'll see this uses parent na domain name if blank. It's very common that you'll leave this field blank. If you're using a DNS service like bind, then the at sign represents root. And let's give it an IP. Let's use the server's loopback. IP and let's not create a pointer record. I'll explain what that is in a bit. And done. So now what we have is a record for contoso.com. See it's used the same as parent. 
so there's no suffix to it whatsoever. Contoso.com will resolve to 127001. Let's see if it does. And it does. Now, you may be wondering, how did this server client know about this server as a server role? And, or maybe you weren't curious. Let me show you why it's an important question. If we go to the Windows Services and jump down to DNS, this server actually is wearing two hats. Pretty well every server is going to take a role as a DNS client, but this one is also taking a role as a server. So you see I have the server installed and a client which is installed by default. So a client role you'll see on our network adapter here. And notice what I've done is temporarily for the sake of this demo, I've set this to 127001. Normally on this machine, I'll leave it at 8888 and 88.8.8 .8 .8 .8 .8 .8 .8 and 8.8.4.4. .8 .4. Those are Google's free DNS services, and I use them for some servers uh, that aren't in a corporate network. If you're in a corporate network, then you want to use your corporate DNS servers, of course. So let's take a look here. Uh, that's why when I can do a ping from my command prompt, it's going to be using this DNS server here. Okay, so now okay, let's do one more A record. And let's do FTP as an example. And let's go to Google's other DNS servers. So now if I were to ping ftp.contosa.com, notice that the IP works here. So we've set this up. So now let's create an alias. An alias is the same thing as a host record, except rather than going to an IP, it goes to a friendly DNS name. So let's use your most common one is your www, and that's going to resolve to contoso.com. So we only have to maintain contoso.com here, and then our www will always update with it. Let's test it. And sure enough, so we ping www.contoso.com goes to the same IP address that we had set at the one place. That's pretty straightforward. The only thing that you need to keep track of is an A record always goes to an IP, and an alias always goes to a friendly name. So the other common one that you're going to see is your MX record, and that's used for your mail. And again, if you're going to send an email to something like you know Scott at Vastnet.com, it has to know well what server is that. It may not be the same server as your mail server, or your web server. It could be something completely different. Okay, at this top one, very similar to before, almost always you're going to leave this blank because basically if it's blank it means something at contosa.com. Okay, it has to be a fully qualified domain name. It cannot be, it's not supposed to be allowed to be an IP address. And so we're going to set here, uh, let's just do mail.google.com for example. And this is made up, it's not a real address just for the sake of this demo. So we're going to hit OK. Notice the mail priority. A 10 is a higher priority than, let's say, a 20. So the, a 1 is the highest priority. 99, I believe, is the lowest priority. Generally, you're going to use a 10s and 20s and 30s are the common ones that you'll see. So we're going to add this one. Now let's add another one. You, it's completely acceptable. Let's make this mail 2.google.com. It's completely acceptable to use the same priority, 2 with a 10. And what that means, it's going to kind of load balance. It's going to alternate between those. But what we often want is one that's a 20. And the reason you're going to see this in the wild is for, let's say, something like a backup mail one.google.com, let's say. And we can even have another one. Let's give it a priority of thirty. So what's going to happen is incoming mail is going to alternate between these two, and if both of those are down, it's going to go to our backup mail one, and if backup mail one is down, it's going to go to two. Now understand, spammers don't have to listen to those rules. It's completely up to them, and sometimes they'll try to attack your backup mail servers hoping that you have more holes in it. And so this is just a suggestion for law-abiding mail servers, and not necessarily for, for spammers. Okay, the other common record that you may see is a TXT record. And originally that was just kind of a catch-all, but that's been used by SPF. SPF stands for Center of Policy Framework, 
and that's used for spam filter and I'll cover that some other week as well. And additionally you can also create wildcards and that's been supported for forever. So this can also go to an IP. Let's try this to 8.8.8.8 .8 .8 .8. and let's ping 8.8.8.8 Now if we ping something like unknown dot contosa.com notice that that resolves to the 8.8.8.8 but if I ping dub 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 then that still resolves to what it's set at. So notice that a wildcard is always lowest priority. If something's explicitly set, it's always going to take precedence over any kind of wildcards. And in addition to everything else I've shown, there are other types of records as well. Like an SRV is used in domain controllers. You have other ones that are used, but for the most part, when it comes to the web, these are the main ones that you're going to use. And for example, the VastNet service, we use Dyn DNS. And you can see that we have the standard MX records we just covered, you have A records, C name, it's pretty straightforward. So there you go, a lot to cover in 10 minutes. Will you find this useful in the real world? I hope you tune in next week. Thank you.